Okay, I, I've been told I only have uh, 25 minutes, so um, in the interest of getting as much information to you as possible and hopefully leaving some minutes for a q and I'm, I'm going to get started. My name is Gary Vogel. I'm the CEO of Eagle Bulk Shipping. Uh, we are listed on NASDAQ. Um, I'm going to uh, go fairly quickly because we have quite a few slides, but like I said, feel free to uh, raise your hand in the middle or we'll do Q&A at the end, and I'm absolutely happy to stay after and answer any questions. I think we'll start out with what differentiates Eagle. So Eagle's a fully integrated ship owner operator. We're engaged in the carriage of dry bulk commodities. But what differentiates us? Well, we're focused exclusively on the mid-size segment within dry bulk. Our ships are all between 50 and 65,000 dead weight. Also of our 53 owned ships, 47 are fitted with scrubbers, exhaust gas cleaning systems. And I'll speak a bit more about that as a competitive advantage and a differentiator. We employ an active management approach to fleet trading. Um, it's really not dissimilar than active management in, in finance, right? All with a goal to outperform the underlying benchmark indices. Uh, we perform all of our management services in-house, strategic, commercial, um, operational, technical. Um, as a result, we don't have any uh, related party fees and fees and transactions, you know, leaving, leaving the, um, the company. In fact, we're, we're rated between number one and three over the last five years in terms of corporate governance with a focus on ESG. We're headquartered in Stamford, Connecticut with offices in Copenhagen and Singapore. This is 20 years of the Baltic Supermax Index. Needless to say, it's a pretty volatile, um, volatile uh, daily rate for our ships. I think the important thing to focus on here is, is that orange trend line. Our market bottomed out in February of 2016. We believe we've been in a cyclical uptrend as the supply side, supply of ships has moderated. Um, we've had a lot of challenges on the way to get here. Um, things like Asian swine flu, a lack of soybean demand, trade wars, tariffs, obviously COVID, collapse of fuel prices, things like that. But we're in a much different place today. Another takeaway of this slide, I think, is to look and say, notwithstanding the fact that we're at very strong rates today at about $28,000 per ship per day, if you go back to the mid, mid um, first of the first decade, you can see significantly higher rates than that. Um, in the fourth quarter, we realized net income of almost $90 million. In fact, that quarter was more than we ever made in a year at Eagle. Um, we also executed a $400 million uh, comprehensive refinancing, um, extending our maturity of our bank debt out by to five years. Paid down $71 million of debt in the quarter. We also instituted a dividend based on the third quarter results going forward, and, and we've paid out two quarters of dividends now, $2 based on third quarter results, and $2.05 based on fourth quarter. Our, our policy states uh, board's intention to distribute a minimum of 30% of net income on the quarter. Um, this is the U.S. listed peers. What you'll see here is with the gray bars, there are some companies that are larger than Eagle in terms of fleet count, but we're the largest within the mid-size segment and the only listed company with a focus on one asset class. And we think that's important as an active owner operator having operational efficiencies. In other words, having two ships open in the U.S. Gulf within a few days of each other gives us the flexibility to swap one for the other for various reasons. If you owned a Cape size ship and a Supermax vessel, there's no cross uh, benefit. A Cape size ship will never carry a Supermax cargo and of course a Supermax 50,000 deadweight ship can't carry 150,000 tons of cargo. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to go fairly quickly here. I know I'm speaking quickly, but this is our business model. I, I, I mentioned the, so there's two ways for ships to earn money, basically. One is called time charter. Think of a car rental business. Um, people you know, show up, they pay a daily rate, they get used to the car. In our business, you get used to the ship, you pay for fuel, you decide where it goes, and you bring it back at a pre-agreed time, time and uh, location. Same thing, that's a time charter. We do that, but we prefer to live above that in what's called voyage chartering. This is where we get paid a per ton basis to carry cargo for customers. Customers, whether they're miners, growers, traders, receivers, and users. And one benefit there is when we agree to carry, call it 50,000 tons of grain for someone, we can show up with any of the 53 ships we own. Actually, we can show up with any ship in the world, and there's a lot of owners, a lot of the peers, listed peers I mentioned, and other companies that they just lease their ships out. So we're a natural consumer of those ships. We lease them in, so all of a sudden, instead of having 53 ships I can use, there's over 3,800 mid-size geared ships in the world. Um, we perform what we call vessel and cargo arbitrage. We find better ships for cargoes, 
rather than our own, better cargoes for ships that we might have, and we time charter ships in. We use derivatives to hedge away market risk. There's always optional periods. You know, on a car rental, you have an hour maybe to bring the car back after the agreed period for free. Well, in shipping, you get sometimes three months, four months, depending on the period. And we use that to our advantage by using derivatives to, to create what we call asymmetric optionality. So that's the model, but here's the output. Um, the green line is the Baltic Supermax Index, um, and the blue line is our net TCE. So after all the business we do, what's left after paying commissions and expenses? If this went back two years, you would see that we, our blue line outperformed the Baltic Supermax Index for four years straight, with the exception of one quarter in 2019. Um, last year, that flipped, and that's because our market went really hyperbolic, and it's virtually impossible to beat a rapidly rising market because your, your voyages have fixed revenue, and every day that index is going up. There's a, I, I always said I'd love a, to have to explain why we didn't beat a market that went from $10,000 to $40,000 in a year, and that's what happened last year. Um, first quarter, obviously, is behind us now, but we haven't reported, so I can't speak to our results except what's already been made public, which is that as of our last earnings call, we were 95% fixed for the first quarter at a net TCE of 27,200. So first quarter was, was quite far along uh, when we reported that. You can see that the market had come off on the dotted green line for the first quarter, but as of today, the, that market's recovered, and the spot, not the overall dotted line, but the spot Baltic Supermax Index today is right around 28,000. Um, dollars per ship per day. Um, net TCE translates to EBITDA, and what you can see here is obviously that progression follows, follows our, earn, um, our net TCE, and over the last two quarters we've made in excess of $90 million in EBITDA in each of those quarters. Um, our business um, is, is, our balance sheet is, is supported by the steel of our assets, 53 ships. Um, asset prices have gone up by over 100% last year. In fact, we acquired nine ships at the end of 2020 and early part of 2021, and those, those ships, that $100 million um, that we invested in those ships has effectively doubled. So ship values are up significantly, and they're really driven by future expectation of future cash flow. And if you look at the futures market for ship, for, for um, revenue, for charter rates, it's pretty flat right now. I mentioned to you that the spot index is at $28,000 per day. And the, and the market for the second quarter is around 31, for the third quarter is right around 30, and the fourth quarter 26. So it's a, the market, like I said, is pretty flat and supportive of robust rates. Um, this is just an annual of the Baltic Supermax Index chart that we already went over. And this is all on our website, so you're welcome to download it. I mentioned that Eagle, 90% of our fleet are fitted with exhaust gas cleaning systems or scrubbers. So on January 1st, 2020, the IMO, um, the, the governing body for, for shipping of the UN, um, came out, the regulation came into effect where all ships had to cut their sulfur emissions by 85% overnight. I mean, we knew it was coming, but it really was, a, it was binary from December 31st to January 1st. The vast majority of our peers, 95% of the mid-sized ships in the world, chose to, um, to comply with this regulation by burning le less sulfurous fuel effectively a more refined product that costs more. Eagle took a different tack. We invested about $100 million on installing exhaust gas cleaning systems on our ships. And so you say, well, why would you spend $100 million? And the answer is, is because our view was that the more sulfurous fuel that we're still allowed to burn because we clean the sulfur out of the exhaust gas, we would get paid back on that. So this is that graph of the fuel spread. Well, the dark gray is the underlying crude. You can see a strong correlation between crude prices and spreads. And then you can see the fuel, the fuel spread is the dark blue line. Unfortunately, um, the market collapsed with COVID because we didn't expect that the world would stop flying. And very low sulfur fuel oil competes with things like jet fuel. And the world stopped flying, and so pr the, the fuel spread collapsed. The good news for Eagle is that's behind us, and fuel spreads have widened dramatically. It's right now around $200 per ton. Um, at $200 per ton, Eagle would generate around $50 million of incremental EBITDA a year. And again, I'll remind you, that was on a $100 million investment. So at the moment, very robust. Based on the forward curve, which is the dotted line, uh, we estimate we would make around $34 million on an annualized basis. Still a robust return, you know, about, about you know, um, 30% unlevered. 
So this is my 34th year in dry bulk, and I tell everybody who wants to listen, or even if they don't want to listen, the most important thing, if I could only have one metric to, to look at future health of dry bulk, it's supply. It's number of ships coming into the market. I've seen many cycles and come and go, but ultimately it's too much supply that kills, kills a market. Um, right now we're in a really interesting situation because notwithstanding very strong rates, the order book is still at historic lows, and, you, and I'll get to a reason why. But at the moment, um, the order book is just over 6%, meaning of the ships on the water, there's about 6% of, as, a, as a, a you know, percentage of that that are ordered, not just for delivery next year, but to, for delivery in the future over the next few years. Um, so normally in a robust rate environment that we've seen, you'd see a supply side response. Owners would go out and order ships. I would add too many ships. And then when they came into the market, you'd end up with rates coming down. There's three main reasons why that hasn't happened. One is the yards are really full building other kinds of ships. Container ships, I'm sure you've seen all the issues around supply side. The container market has gone out and ordered an incredible number of ships, record number. And those ships are large, complex, expensive, and take a long time to build. There's also a lot of other kinds of ships like LNG carriers that are, that are being built. That's good for dry bulk because yards prefer yards who have the capability prefer to build higher, more higher value, more complex projects with higher margins. Um, secondly, because of inflation and the yards aren't that hungry because they have their order books are backed up, um, the pricing has gone up. So two years ago, you could have ordered an Ultramax vessel, a mid-sized ship, for in China for around 22 million. Today, that's 33 million. So. The price you're paying for that same asset, just like the second-hand ships, has gone up dramatically. And third, and this is a really important one, it's the uncertainty on future regulation regarding carbon and decarbonization and emissions. No one knows what the requirements will be. We're pretty sure there's going to be taxation on carbon you know, pricing, but these ships have typically have a 25-year lifespan. You order a ship today that isn't going to deliver until 2025, that ship's only going to be 40% through its economic life in 2035 with a lot of uncertainty as to whether you're going to even be allowed to, to burn conventional fuel for the latter part of its life. We've focused, we've bought 29 ships over the last five years, all of them averaging around 2015 as a year of build, and that's by design because that ship will be 20 years old in the same, at the same time frame of 2035, effectively being 80% through its economic life. So I think those three things are reasons why we haven't seen the order book build and why we as a company don't expect to see robust ordering. In fact, in the first quarter, um, only 15 ships in the mid-size segment were ordered, so a very, very low number. So on the other side of supply, of course, is demand. So this graph shows at a high level. Um, the blue line is dry bulk trade. The green line is, is year over year GDP uh, growth. And what you'll no, no question, there's a high correlation between dry bulk demand and, and global GDP. Um, another good takeaway here, it's, it's faint, but you can see the line there, um, which is at 0% in terms of year over year. And we've only had one year on a ton mile basis in which dry bulk demand didn't grow. And that was during the financial crisis, and that was actually more due to a drying up of trade credit. And you can see the blue line spiked as soon as the window opened up again. So we have dry bulk demand is growing, effectively has been growing every year. Um, and then you have very limited supply. If we drill down into the numbers, again, I apologize, I'm speaking quickly. <laughs> Um, if we drill down into the numbers, if we look at the middle column here, uh, a little bit down, you'll see dry bulk in ton mile demand for 2021 was 3.9%. That was obviously a big pickup on, on the previous year because of COVID. Um, but what we think is really interesting is look at the, bo the bold numbers in major bulk and minor bulk. So major bulk in dry cargo is coal, iron ore, and grain. Minor bulk is easy. It's everything else. So why is this important? Well, if you look to the pie chart to the right, the gray is the major bulks, the blue is the minor bulks. Eagle derives two-thirds of its demand from minor bulks. And why is this important? Well, if you look at that middle column again, you'll see that last year, that 3.9%, it was made up of 3% in major bulk, but 5.2% in minor bulk. And so minor bulks are leading the charge in terms of demand. And if we look at this year, although things are more, more muted at 1.9% at on a ton mile basis, in absolute, it's 0.7%. Major bulks are essentially flat on a non-ton mile basis, whereas minor bulks, again, are, are leading that. And that translates 
to the demand against that muted supply we talked about. Um, this is a graphic which just effectively shows the versatility of the mid-sized segment, right? The, the larger ships, cape size vessels carry coal, iron ore, and some bauxite, and coal and iron ore are basically servicing two industries, power generation in terms of steam coal and steel production, met coal and, and iron ore, whereas our ships carry everything, so we have much more versatility, so historically much less volatility, also less reliance on China. China's responsible for almost 50% of major bulk demand and about 22% of minor bulk demand. This is a, 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 a calculation we put up to illustrate the differences within dry bulk. You know, many people look at dry bulk and, and all the peers and say, okay, you're all the same. But this just shows over the last year, what we did was the top talks about a supermax, ultramax. Had you bought a five-year-old ship in December of, of 2020, that ship would have cost 15.5 million. In fact, Eagle bought ships for 15.5 million. Over the last um, 16, you know, 15 months, uh, five quarters, the BSI, the Baltic Supermax Index, has averaged $26,443. When you take out a pro forma expense for operating expenses in GNA, you end up with operating income of 20,000. Same calculation for Cape size, but that ship uh, cost 26.5 million. It earned a bit more. It earned uh, 29,000, but it cost significantly more, 1.7 times. So on a yield basis over the last 15 months, if you, if you bought those ships on an unlevered basis, the annualized yield on, that super, on the Ultramax vessel was 47% and 31% on the Cape. I mean, 31% is a good return, but on a relative basis, the Supermax Ultramax outperformed it by 15%. And as we stand here today, based on the, I believe it's because based on the demand numbers I was talking about, the Supermax index is at 28,000, whereas that Cape size index, ships that cost 1.7 times as much, is around $12,000 today. Those are much more volatile assets, and you'll see the um, rates go up and down in meaningful ways, but year to date, it's, extreme, it's been extremely weak. This slide speaks about operational leverage. Our, our expenses on our ships, as you would imagine, are, are essentially fixed uh, on our 53 ships. So we have our, our, you know, our debt, we have our operating expenses, we have our GNA that I talked about. So this slide is on an illustrative basis. We look, if we look to the right and we see, look at the middle, the, the, the bar is second from the right, we took the Baltic Supermax Index since inception, which has averaged 17,000 through the highs and the lows. And on an illustrative basis, assuming $150 fuel spread, $1,000 outperformance for Eagle's platform, and other assumptions, which are all in the footnotes, we would generate around $150 million of net income, about $222 million of EBITDA. And if you look to the right is, is the uh, high of the market in 2007, 16 is the low, and the first set of bars on the left side is the actual uh, market year to date plus the forward curve as of, as of the date of this um, graph, uh, which I believe is about a week ago, and that would average, that market averages, uh, um, you know, on, on both actual and forward curve around 25,000, and we would generate, in an illustrative basis, $291 million of net income and three, 363 of EBITDA. So it shows in a meaningful way that every thousand dollars of incremental revenue, whether it's because of our performance or scrubbers, uh, fuel spreads, or because the underlying market equates to $17.5 million dollars of net income or $1.36 a share. This is the summary slide. I'm not going to take you through it all, but I think in the interest of time, I'll stop there and I'm more than happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Yes? So, right. 
So when it ter in terms of diversifying into other sectors, the short answer is no. We're focused on, on dry bulk. It's, it's what we as a, as a company and I uh, believe our core competency is in and, and that's where we're focused. Having said that, we've been the beneficiary of the um, ex expansion in, in rates in the container trade. We're not carrying containers ourselves. Uh, we could fit our, sh our ships to carry some containers, not, not nowhere near what a purpose-built container ship of the same size could, um, but could carry some containers. Where we've decided to focus, though, instead of retrofitting to carry some containers, is we've been picking up cargoes that historically, before the, call it the post-COVID uh, trade or the COVID trade for container ships, is bag cargoes that were stuffed into containers, we're now carrying them as break bulk cargo on our ships. So almost going back to the way it was before containerization, we're carrying those particularly from Asia to places like West Coast, South America, and Central America. Things like fertilizer, what's that? Yeah, so we're doing, we are doing that. Yeah, but it's, um, I believe this is a transitional trade, um, that this is not permanent because when container rates return, you know, trade finds its, its most efficient means, always. And so containers, the reason that these cargoes, these bag cargoes go in containers, there's a number of reasons, but if you think about it, they can get loaded into a container straight onto a ship, and then when they get discharged, onto a truck and right to the destination. When you go onto our ship, it needs to be warehoused, it needs to be put on the ship, off of the ship into a warehouse, then onto a truck. So you have much more steps, but it's only because at the moment the container rates are so high that you have that added ability, that, that, that cost that you can do for warehousing and things like that. So I believe when, when container rates return at some, at some point to a more normal place, we'll see the, those trades migrate back. Um, any other questions? All right. Well, eventually I think the answer is yes, um, because sh shipping is cyclical, including our business, and, and there's a lot of ships on order, and, and it's not a project that they'll you know, drop dramatically, but, but the answer is, yeah, there, there will be ships that fill, fill the void. Um, you know, in terms of timing, I'm not in the container trade. I'm, I'm a very interested observer, um, but I, I would say this way. I think there are very significant dislocations in the global economy right now. And if I speak to dry bulk, what we're seeing, and if you look at our ton mile, there's huge dislocations in things like the grain trade. You know, aside from the humanitarian crisis of, of the war in Ukraine, um, very significant portion of the wheat, global wheat market and, and to some extent corn comes out of the Black Sea, out of Ukraine. And so what we're seeing now is we're actually carrying cargo from Brazil to North Africa. That's a trade that wouldn't have happened before and we're moving coal from Indonesia to the continent. Again, a trade that Eagle has never done. So these dislocations you know, are, are here for the foreseeable future, and I think you have sim similar dislocations going on in other bulk commodity trades, not just dry. Yes? Yes, yeah, sure, so, um, yeah, so we're, we are very focused on, on the transition to, uh, you know, a, a, a reduction and ultimately a zero carbon, carbon emission world. Um, at the moment, the technology for our size ships simply isn't there. It's not just, it, it's, it's closest in terms of the technology for ships that can burn ammonia, let's say, or, or, or methanol. But the supply chain, the fuel supply chain, and the availability is something that needs to be solved. So we're, we're in a number of industry groups. We're, we're a mission partner with the Maersk McKinney uh, Molar uh, Center for Zero Emission Shipping, getting to zero a number. It's on, uh, you can see on our website, in fact, we have a, a sustainability report that speaks about that. We recently did a biofuel voyage where we steamed a ship, the Sydney Eagle, from Europe across the Atlantic exclusively on biofuel. Um, again, it's not an economically viable solution at the moment, but this is all things that we're doing to put ourselves in a position so when we can, um, that, that we're, we're a leader amongst the uh, mid-sized dry bulk. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, I think I'm getting the times up. So thanks very much for your time. I appreciate it. <laughs>